Good morning, everyone, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to take part in this fantastic conference. With this talk, I'd like to present a research that I've been developing over the past years. I'll offer a quick walkthrough of some of the issues I've developed in a book that came out in 2018 for Palgrave Macmillan and is entitled Displacing Caravaggio, Art, Media and Humanitarian Visual Culture. I'll show you a few paintings and make a few references to contemporary photographs and communications that mainly due to copyright issues I don't have the opportunity to show here. In the summer of 2014, a painting by Caravaggio was the focus of negotiations between several institutions. The work in question was the seven works of mercy which Caravaggio delivered to the confraternity of the Church of Pio Monte della Misericordia in Naples on January 9, 1607. The aim was to show the seven works of mercy at the exhibition stand organized by the Italian branch of Caritas Internationalis, one of the most important NGOs in the world, on the occasion of the Universal Exhibition held in Milan in 2015. The reason for the requested loan are to be found in the theme of Expo 2015, Feeding the Planet Energy for Life. After a period of controversy, the idea came to nothing. The work remained in Naples. At the beginning of 2016, Caravaggio's Seven Works of Mercy was the center of a diatribe over another possible transfer of the work. The idea was to show the painting in the Quirinal, the residence of the President of the Italian Republic, for the Jubilee of Mercy inaugurated by Pope Francis and conceived as a tribute to the condition of migrants attempting to reach Europe. Once again, the hoped for move never came about. A group of art historians published an open letter in which they asked the Italian president, Sergio Mattarella, to prevent the transfer in order to protect the painting and its original context. On June 2, 2016, the Italian president inaugurated the Museum of Trust and Dialogue for the Mediterranean on the island of Lampedusa. The exhibition was based on various objects recovered from shipwrecks of recent years, and in particular the one of October 3, 2013, in which 368 migrants perished off the coast of the Isola dei Conigli. Several screens were installed on the walls showing television images of rescues at sea, while in an inner room at the center of the exhibition route was Caravaggio's sleeping Cupid, painted in 1608 and commonly kept at the Galleria Palatina in Florence. The Uffizi director, Eike Schmidt, justified the transfer of the sleeping Cupid as a generic artistic tribute, I quote, to all the children for whom help did not arrive in time, end of quote, but also as a message of hope for the future. The exhibition ended on October 31, 2016, in a wire of journalists visiting the island for the occasion. So what position should we take on these types of actions? Should we offer generic praise for the attempt to bring artistic and historic heritage of the past into the present, or should we firmly criticize acts that not only decontextualize paintings, but are also morally impertinent toward the real conditions of suffering experienced by people assisted by the work of NGOs? By embracing one or the other of these two solutions, one actually misses out on the opportunity effectively offered by the construction of a humanitarian Caravaggio to examine the interweaving between the most tragic images of the present day and the iconographic repertoire of Western art. Beyond the physical transfers of artworks mentioned above, is it possible to conceive of displacement of art objects 
as a useful theoretical and critical paradigm of public engagement. As I'll try to explain, displacement doesn't necessarily coincide with a physical transfer, but it corresponds with the inauguration of a process of analysis and comparison of different images, with the aim of reflecting critically on their respective fields, our history and humanitarian communication. In other terms, is it possible to see in Caravaggio's works certain details that may help us critically understand the evolution of humanitarian visual culture? So let's try to look at the seven works of mercy from our humanitarian present. Let's try to offer a contribution to the controversial question of the origins of humanitarianism from the perspective of art history. As we know from the Gospel of Matthew and other theological sources, the works of corporal mercy are seven. To feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, to visit the imprisoned, to bury the dead. The originality, but one might also say the topicality of Caravaggio's seven works of mercy, seems therefore to reside in a series of movements performed by the artist. First of all, compared to previous iconographies, the painting disrupts the separation of individual works in favor of the plasticity and spectacularity of suffering and mercy. In the seven works of mercy, the duty to shelter the homeless is represented with the figure of a host. With his left hand, he is making a welcoming gesture to a man who appears in front of him. Moving on to the present, this same approach has been adopted by large operational area of UN agencies, as well by NGOs that manage multiple camps scattered around the world. When looking at the phenomenon of refugee camps from a long-term perspective, it becomes evident that the offer of a shelter tends to extend into other forms of assistance, which range from distributing basic necessities to providing educational and psychological support. In the seven works of mercy, the need for water and food are separated. The first is expressed through the reference to Samson, and the second through the shocking breastfeeding figure of Pero, which combines the acts of visiting prisoners and giving food to the hungry. These two acts of mercy, whose complementarities experimented with by Caravaggio, also tend to converge in humanitarian iconography, although not exclusively. Think of the monitoring function usually associated with healthcare and moral support that has historically been performed by the Red Cross in battlefields around the world, or the function of public condemnation and appeal for reconciliation performed by organizations such as Amnesty International. The duty to clothe the naked assumes paradigmatic importance. From the point of view of influences, this figure collapsed on the ground was inspired by Michelangelo's naked figures, the Nudi, in the Sixteen Chapel. But what distinguishes Caravaggio's twist on it is the fact that such a naked figure is inscribed in a moral dispositive like the Works of Mercy, a dispositive that can only establish itself and functioning in the presence of a form of life that is entirely qualified by need. With the works of mercy, a figure without a clear social determination, in a certain sense without a habitus, enters the Western visual culture. We know that he is in need, we know that he suffers, but we tend to ignore the reason, whether as a result of an illness, an economic misfortune, or other causes. We could therefore say that Caravaggio's painting invites us to reflect on a paradoxical form of recognition, that situation in which the subject is recognized and assists precisely because it coincides with what contemporary political philosophy has defined as bare life. As we have seen, Caravaggio explicitly confronts life and death, understood as two aesthetic conditions. 
He focuses particularly on bodies, which he represents with the same level of detail in both the lower parts, feet, heels, and the upper parts, the faces of the sacred figures. He investigates epidermis and conditions of sensitivity and insensitivity. In many cases, Caravaggio's paintings attempt to represent the very moment in which a body passes from life to death, or miraculously, from death to life. The depiction of the exact moment in which this transformation takes place constitutes a challenge to pictorial representation, but it also seems to me to offer some interesting insights into rethinking humanitarian communication and some of its long-standing rhetoric. Looking at images from the archives of the World Health Organization, as well as from reportage by famous photographers and recent humanitarian campaigns, the medical care is represented as an attempt to open up the insensitive body in order to regenerate it in a graceful posture. What, after all, has humanitarian communication been, if not a continuous attempt to represent synthetically, in the instantaneousness of the photographic shot, the process of care and healing? So, which religious legacies, which ideologies tend to hide in the ways in which we still represent the cure or the healing process? But Caravaggio's painting is also an extraordinary repertoire of gesture of pathos. According to the great art historian Roberto Longhi, Caravaggio obtained the religious figures of his masterpieces, drawing inspiration from the gestures of the men and women who roamed the streets of 17th century Rome, Naples, and other cities where he lived. His paintings offer us the opportunity to reflect on the relationship between the spontaneity of the gestures of pathos that emerge in different contexts and how they are appropriated first in the frame of Christian iconography and secondly in humanitarian communication. I'm thinking here of many humanitarian campaigns but also of photographs of great social impact such as those awarded every year by the WordPress photo. I limit myself to mentioning the photo taken by Hossein in 1997 in Algeria and promptly renamed in journalistic discourse as the Madonna of Bentala, without taking into consideration the cultural and religious context in which these gestures of pathos took place. Caravaggio's painting is not only made up of suffering bodies and extreme gestures. Anticipating some trends that would characterize the European painting of the 17th century, he was the first to put in the image what we still call the everyday life. This is a cyclical and dilated temporality within which gestures of rest and leisure, even in difficult contingencies, take shape. This is the case of a painting with a religious theme, such as rest on the flight into Egypt, painted between 1595 and 1596. In an even more explicit way, the space and time of everyday life emerges in the musicians, painted in 1597. But an absolutely everyday experience also emerges from the card sharps, painted in 1594 and dedicated to anonymous figures who enjoy playing cards. A photographer like John Vink, to whom I dedicated great attention in my book, seems to have been explicitly inspired by these paintings for his reportage realized between 1987-1994 in refugee camps all over the world. I can't show you his photos within this video presentation, but just take a look on the photographer's website. His shots bring out the expressive capacity of individuals who are forced to live as refugees. At the beginning of the talk, I referred to the notion of bare life. Yet Caravaggio invites us to reflect on the fact that even within a refugee camp, there always persists an intersubjective social and political life, 
and that no life should be conceived as purely naked or denuded of these prerogatives. This is an invitation, if you will, to reconceive the humanitarian visual culture in a participatory way, where the assisted subject themselves can take on microphone and camera, building new scenarios of meaning and new iconographies. I'd like to be able to go into other examples in greater depth. I limit myself to mentioning once again the painting that was physically transferred to Lampedusa, the sleeping Cupid where we observe a naked child against a black background. He is asleep, unable to return our gaze. The setting up of the Lampedusa exhibition did not give us the possibility to look and reflect in a critical and self-critical way. But moving this painting out of its context and observing it within, with the eyes of today obliges us to come to terms with some of the most problematic aspects of humanitarian visual culture. On the centrality of the figure of childhood, but also on the fact that entire areas of the world have sometimes been subjected to infantilizing representations. An invitation, therefore, also in this case, to question our gaze and to conceive of images that are not based on the asymmetry between the adult and the child, between who is awake and who is asleep. I must set out to conclude. Through the expression displacing Caravaggio, I've taken up a term that has multiple meanings. In the first instance, we can look to the psychoanalytical meaning of displacement, a mechanism that, according to Sigmund Freud, can take on a defensive function and, I quote, whose essence lies in the diversion of the train of thought, the displacement of the psychical emphasis on a topic other than the opening one, end of quote. In the second place, the verb to displace refers to extremely concrete actions. Its proximity with other verbs such as to dismiss, to exile, to deport, is impossible to overlook. To think of displacing as a method for visual culture studies requires, first of all, becoming aware of the phenomena of repression and deportation in the psychoanalytical and political field. It means also to understand that arts and images have always been part of geographical, moral, and political processes of construction of borders between what belongs to our culture and what is provisionally considered as external, between what is presumed to be properly human and what is not, etc. At the same time, when faced with certain images, what happens is something like an opening toward a multiplicity of visual and conceptual potentialities. Caravaggio and other celebrated masters did not merely represent living bodies and inert objects, but invite us to look at the ways in which they represented both bodies and objects and thus the ways in which we continue to look at such sensitive issues. Today, more than ever, those who deal with communication are called to confront a self-critical process of decolonization of the gaze. My impression is that opening a confrontation with the tradition of Western art history can be an opportunity to challenge visual culture thus decentralizing and regenerating the art historical debate itself. Beyond Caravaggio, I look forward to understanding what aesthetic and political challenges come along with the possibility of displacing the wider field of the arts. And I stop here and thank you very much for your attention.